Hi, everyone. This is Richard Eidlin with Business for America. We're really happy to have you today for this important webinar on how business can address the threats facing our democracy. Um, this webinar is being organized in parallel to the White House Summit for Democracy, which, as you may know, uh, is a two-day event that begins tomorrow and involves 110 countries who are gathering virtually to discuss the state of democracy and a number of the threats and risks that a growing acceptance of authoritarianism poses to uh, nations, to their economic success, their social cohesion, and to the stability of their political systems. What we wanted to do today for the next 75 minutes was to dig in to a number of the challenges facing our democracy, and particularly how the private sector can address those uh, challenges by supporting strengthening institutions, by advocating for policies, by working to reduce polarization, and really standing up for a more stable political system that we think will benefit our economy as well as our society. Um, Business for America has been working actively with Protect Democracy, uh, who, who you'll hear from in a moment, and we really thank them uh, for their involvement in this program. We have three parts to the webinar. The first is a presentation by Ian Basson, the co-founder of Protect Democracy. Then we'll hear from Didi Kuo from Stanford University. And finally, a panel um, discussion between Joel Elliott and Dave Leichman, Joel with Salesforce and Dave with Microsoft. And we'll also want to take your questions throughout. So if you do have questions or insights, observations, comments, please post those in the chat or the Q&A function, and I will do my best to get those uh, presented to the speakers. Before we get going, let me turn it over to Business for America's founder, Sarah Bonk. And uh, Bonk, I'll, I'll turn the mic to you. Great. Well, thank you, Richard. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to our partners who helped promote this event. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We are so excited to host this conversation in advance of the U.S. State Department's Summit on Democracy. Uh, as some of you know, before Business for America, I was in the business world myself. I had a successful career at Apple and Cupertino for nearly 15 years, and I left because I believe that the business community has a duty to help protect our representative democracy. And Business for America was founded on this idea that the public interest and the interest of business are aligned in having a well-functioning democracy. Business for America works with civic-minded companies of all sizes to take action in support of protecting and promoting democracy. And this includes encouraging our employees and our customers to vote, advocating for legislation to ensure that every eligible voter has safe, secure access to the ballot box, and encouraging our lawmakers to work across the aisle to help protect our democratic institutions. And I'm happy to report that more and more businesses are looking to join the cause. Now, we have heard some critiques lately that, and maybe you've heard them too, that the companies who care about democracy and voting rights and access to the ballot box are woke capitalists who are using their influence and their resources to advance their own personal, social, and political viewpoints. And in my view, that's nonsense because when it comes to democracy, one of the most uh, fundamental institutions in our society, businesses have an enlightened self-interest, a bottom line economic interest in ensuring that our democracy survives. Now, having a democracy is difficult. It's messy. Uh, as Winston Churchill quipped, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. It's a favorite quote of mine and it's so true on several levels. Um, but first, if you believe as I do, that every person deserves to have a voice in how we are governed, that this e experiment in self-governance is essential to our liberty, then that requires some form of democratic representation. And I hope everyone here can agree on that. Uh, but while that moral argument for democracy is essential, today we're here to make the business case. If you believe in enterprise, entrepreneurship, innovation, markets, and competition, well, Democracy is the best system of government for that too. Uh, the good news is that you don't have to take my word for it. 
We have some terrific panelists here to explain the risks to our democracy, explain why democracy is so important to our market economy and our way of living, and what specifically businesses can do about it. It's going to be a great discussion. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us. And with that, I'll hand the mic back to you, Richard. Great. Good. Thank you, Bonk. And before we hear from Ian, I wanted to <clears throat> thank our co-host in this from across the country. Uh, we really appreciate the support of New Hampshire Business for Social Responsibility, uh, the Greater Seattle Business Association in uh, Washington State, Show Me Integrity <clears throat> in Missouri, the West Philadelphia Corridor Collaborative in Pennsylvania, Network for Responsible Public Policy, and uh, our partners at Protect Democracy. So, Thank you all for helping make this possible today. So let me turn it over to Ian Basson now. Ian is the co-founder and executive director of Protect Democracy, which is based in Washington, DC. Um, Ian previously served as the Associate White House Counsel in the Obama administration, where in addition to counseling the president and senior White House staff on administrative and constitutional law issues, he was also focused on ensuring that White, the White House and executive branch officials complied with the laws, rules, and norms that protect our fundamentally democratic political system. Ian writes extensively on democracy, authoritarianism, and American law and politics uh, in many different publications. And Ian, thanks so much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Richard, and thanks so much, Bonk, for putting this together and for inviting me. Um, I'm really glad to be here with everybody during the summit. Um, and what I'd like to do is give everybody a little bit of a background on what is happening um, to democracy around the world as perhaps a starting point for the conversation we're going to have today about how this might impact the business sector and what the business sector can do about it. Um, so at Protect Democracy, we are a group of progressives, moderates, and conservatives, people who have worked for Democrats, people who have worked for Republicans, but who share a common interest in protecting our constitutional representative democratic form of government, which right now is in danger. Um, and this is not just something that is happening in the United States. The first thing that's really important to understand is that global democracy has been in recession for more than a decade. There are three major international indexes that study the state of democracy around the world and every year rate how democracy is doing around the world. The first of those is based here in the United States and it's Freedom House, which since 1947 has been putting out a report every year on the state of freedom and democracy around the world. And you're looking now at Freedom House's data on how many countries in the world are democratic. And what you see is that more countries became democratic in the last quarter of the 20th century and then peaked some, somewhere around 2006, 2007 before plateauing and beginning to go into reverse. The second of those major international indexes is based in Sweden and it's called VDEM. And if you look at data from VDEM, you see the same thing. So if you look at the graph on the left, that's the percentage of countries around the world that are governed by democratic regimes. And if you look on the right, that's the percentage of the world's population that live under democratic regimes. And I would point your attention to the solid black line on the right that has the little gray bar around it. That's the composite of the global population. And just look what has happened to the percentage of the world's population that is living under democratic regimes in the last decade. It has gone off a cliff. And the third of the major international indexes is based in the UK. And that's the Economist Intelligence Unit, which also puts out a report every year on the state of democracy around the world. And in 2020, that rating in its democracy index hit its lowest point since they started collecting data in 2006. All around the world, democracy is in retreat. And in its place, you are getting more autocratic forms of government. So again, this is now VDEM data out of Sweden showing jumps over the last decade in percentage of the world's population that is both moving from hybrid regimes that are not quite autocratic yet to full-on autocracies. That's the one on the left. And on the right is the percentage of the world's population that is shifting into autocratizing countries. That is countries that are in a transition from democracy to authoritarianism. And of course, the United States has been far from immune to this trend. 
um, over the last decade plus in the United States on all of these indexes, the quality of American democracy has declined. The way that these different indexes do this is they look at a bunch of factors in every country, things like the independence of the judiciary, things like checks on executive power, things like the rhetoric of the public space and whether violence has become prevalent either in, in practice or in rhetoric. And on all of those metrics, you see that the United States has been in decline. And this is being driven by an erosion in attitudes among Americans about the idea of democracy. So for example, 30 years ago, only one in 16 Americans said they would be open to the idea of army rule in this country. Before the 2016 election, that number had jumped to one in six, and today it is one in five. And that is largely being driven by younger Americans. So if you ask older Americans to what extent they agree with the statement that democracy is a necessary form of government, overwhelming majorities of older Americans agree with that sentiment. But once you get to millennials, Gen Z and Gen Y, you're now looking at either a plural, plurality or at best half agree with that sentiment. So much so that in the United States, the percentage of millennials agreed that, who, who agreed that democracy is a bad or very bad form of government was higher in the US prior to the election of Donald Trump than it was in Poland prior to the election of the autocratic law and justice party there. And as a result of these trends, you are getting a wave of autocrats around the world over the last 15 years. And in fact, of all of these countries, the United States is among the most autocratizing countries over the past decade. This again is VDEM data out of Sweden. And if you look at the countries in red who have seen the greatest erosion from democracy to authoritarianism in the last decade, it is Hungary, it is Turkey, it is Poland, it is India, it is Brazil, and yes, it is the United States. So what does this look like? What does it mean when you have an autocratic movement in a country? We consulted a range of the leading scholars in the world on this movement in early 2017 and asked them, is there a clear pattern that happens in all of these countries when these autocratic movements rise? And the answer they gave was absolutely and unequivocally yes. And it doesn't matter whether the leader of that movement is deliberate and strategic and Machiavellian, the way that someone like Viktor Orban is in Hungary, or whether the leader of it is somewhat bumbling and accidental, the way that Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela or Donald Trump in the United States might be. They all do the same six things. And you're looking at them here, from politicizing independent institutions, to spreading disinformation, to aggrandizing executive power, quashing dissent, delegitimizing marginalized communities or corrupting elections. And indeed, of course, we've seen all of those things happen here in the last five years. And in fact, they happened here faster in the last five years than they happened in Turkey under Erdogan or Russia under Vladimir Putin. You'll recall that when Erdogan and Putin first came to power, they were both assumed to be democratic reformers. Erdogan was gonna move Turkey into the European Union and prove the model of an Islamic democracy could work. Putin was gonna carry on Yeltsin's reforms. It took years before people realized that they were both autocratic tyrants. Yet here, all six steps in the authoritarian playbook have been playing out over the last five years. They culminated in what we are learning more and more about every day, which was an effort to overturn the results of the 2020 election. The January 6th committee continues to get to the bottom of this, but what has come into clear focus is that there was a concerted plan to overturn the results of the 2020 election that involved five steps, suppressing people's ability to vote, prematurely claiming victory and alleging fraud, using court challenges to amplify that fraud and delay certification of the results in order to induce state legislatures to step in and appoint a slate of electors different from the ones that the people of their state had selected, and then getting Congress to accept that alternative slate of electors. And of course, if all of those steps failed, which they did, incite a violent mob to stop the peaceful counting of votes at the Capitol. So what is going to happen next? I am not Nostradamus. I cannot tell you the answer to that question. But what I can tell you is what has happened around the world as a possible pathway for what road we might be on. In Hungary, after Viktor Orban lost the premiership in 2002, he claimed he lost because of fraud. And he began consolidating a movement of power when he was out of power to do what he called creating a quote, central political force field that would allow him to rule for 15 to 20 years. We are right now witnessing a very similar state of events in the United States where the defeated autocrat, and I say this as someone who leads a nonpartisan organization that includes Democrats and Republicans, because we need to be truthful about what is happening here. There are Republicans who believe 
in a democratic representative form of government and there are Democrats who believe in them. But we are dealing with an autocrat and we need to name that because this autocrat is trying to do what Viktor Orban did in Hungary, which is create that political force field to keep himself in power legitimately or not. And here's how that is working. First, there are a slate of bills that are being moved in legislatures around the country that are trying to do the four things that are identified on the right, more than 200 bills in 40 states that are designed to change the landscape that prevented the overturning of the 2020 election so that it would be easier to do next time, a legal effort to change the rules around how votes are counted, votes are cast, and votes are certified, being driven by a big lie that the 2020 election was corrupt and stolen when it was not. Second, there's an effort to change personnel. One of the reasons why the 2020 election was not overturned was because principled officials in multiple states, largely Republicans, resisted enormous pressure and stood up to protect the rule of law and do what the law and democracy required to certify the results. On the left, that is the sole Republican member of the Michigan State Canvassing Board who voted to certify the results of the election, Aaron Van Langeveld, who did what the law required. He has not been renominated, as he said, because he voted to certify the results. In the center, that's Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who famously stood up to the pressure to find, quote unquote, 11,000 votes. He is being primaried and is likely to lose his primary to a supporter of the January 6th insurrection, Jody Heiss. And nationwide, the rank and file poll workers that we all meet when we go and vote, many of them were driven from that position by COVID because they trend older and so for public health reasons, understandably, stepped down from those positions in 2020. But today, a wave of threats and threat of violence against poll workers causing more poll workers to leave that post and in their place, ProPublica reported that Stephen Bannon is encouraging Big Lie supporters to sign up to become poll workers around the country. And then lastly, and perhaps most disturbingly, we are seeing a rise in the idea that violence might be an acceptable way to resolve political disputes. On the left is a poll from PRRI that showed 30% of Republicans agree that violence may be necessary to, uh, to, in order to save the country. And then we are also now seeing a movement among local law enforcement officials. In one case here, I'm pointing out, supported by a group called the Claremont Institute that was behind the memo that explained how purportedly the vice president could overturn the results of the last election to create a sheriff's fellowship that would be designed to support sheriffs, and this is what it says down here, uh, to be officers who are not beholden to either federal, state, or city government. And if law enforcement is not beholden to city, state, or federal government, then one has to ask, who are they beholden to, being that those are the only levels of government we have in this country? What does all this mean for business? Well, as Bonk alluded to at the beginning, not good things, because there are a bunch of reasons why business should be very concerned about democratic decline. The first, of course, is the bottom line. Right, that business fares better in open, stable societies with free trade. And Didi's going to talk more about this. But these autocratic leaders are, tend to be nationalist leaders who are in favor of protectionism and closed borders, which, as we know, is a negative drag on international economies, domestic economies, and business interests. The second I want to allude to is a phrase that I've come to call autocratic capture, which is that autocracies demand tribute from CEOs and business leaders. They demand loyalty and fealty not to the business's bottom line, but to the political interests of those in charge. And just to cite one example, the January 6th uh, Select Committee sent requests for documents to a number of companies. There may be people on here who received them. AT&T was, was one of those companies. And in response, the minority leader of the House of Representatives, as you may recall, famously threatened that any company who complied with those legal requests from docu for documents would be retaliated against once his party assumed power. So if you're John Stanky, the CEO of AT&T, you're stuck with an impossible choice. Comply with a lawful subpoena or, and, or, and risk retaliation from the other side or don't comply with a lawful subpoena and be in violation of the law. Being put between that rock and a hard place is not a position that any business or CEO wants to be in, but in a non-democratic, more autocratic form of government, that moment will come for you at a time of its choosing, not yours. And then of course, lastly, as corporate citizens, as American citizens, and speaking for myself as a parent, we have a moral obligation to the next generation to bequeath to them a stronger form of government than the one we have inherited over the first 240 years of our experiment in self-government. Um, so I'm 
Looking forward to taking questions later on, but I wanted to provide that overview of what's happening globally, what's happening domestically, and how important it is that we all play our role in this moment in history to stand up for the form of government that our founders gave us. Um, and with that, let me turn it back over to the moderators. Thank you. Great. Ian, thank you so much. Um, and just as a reminder, if folks have questions, please put them in the chat and um, we'll, get, we'll get to those. Ian, let me ask you just a quick follow-up here. Um, when you think of the power and influence of the business community in the United States um, and, you know, um, the, the historic importance of business in shaping society, what are some specific approaches, strategies that business can take in the coming year to ward off some of these adverse trends that you just identified? Yeah, well, you know, most scholars point to the 1965 Voting Rights Act as the moment that America really became a fully fledged democracy, that obviously at our founding, we excluded women, we excluded people of color from exercising the franchise until the early part of the 20th century, we didn't bring women into the franchise. And of course, until 1965, in the Voting Rights Act, we really did not empower African Americans to be able to participate fully and vote in this country, because even after enfranchisement, there was Jim Crow, there were efforts to suppress the vote. Um, that Voting Rights Act has been reauthorized numerous times uh, since it was enacted. The most recent time it was reauthorized was in 2006 under the George W. Bush administration with enormous overwhelming bipartisan support, almost unanimous bipartisan support. And at that moment in time, the business community was front and center supporting the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. The CEO of Walmart wrote personally to President Bush to offer his support. Numerous companies came out publicly to support both Republicans and Democrats on insisting that the Voting Voting Rights Act was a linchpin of making sure we actually had a fair, equitable, representative democracy. Um, in the most recent cycle, this last, this last couple of years, when Texas and Georgia moved to begin passing legislation that I alluded to in my slide presentation that would restrict access to the ballot, that would change and corrupt and hyper-politicize vote counting and certification processes. Many CEOs, many companies in both Georgia and Texas, Delta, Coca-Cola, Major League Baseball, Dow Computers, American Airlines, came out and spoke forcefully in defense of core democratic voting freedoms. And that made a big difference. That actually caused both of those bills to be less bad. So there is a real role for business to play in making it clear that this is not a partisan issue. Supporting democracy, supporting voting is an American issue that every company should feel squarely on solid ground and footing, standing in support of, just as has happened throughout the history since 1965. And, and Ian, as you know, Business for America you know, was quite involved in what we put together, helped put together Business for Voting Rights Coalition, which mobilized several hundred companies to support the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And I think to be you know, fully transparent, um, it seemed to have very little impact on the decision and the thinking of a number of Republican senators in particular. So as you think forward, what additional pressure might the business community seek to apply? Because yes, it did in Georgia and Texas, maybe the bills were watered down a bit, but they still passed. And in many cases, the legislature seemed to ignore the interests and concerns of the business community. So what might some next steps be? Yeah, well, first, I don't think that the legislatures in Texas and Georgia did ignore those concerns. I think that they were quite responsive to it, so much so that some of the groups that had been behind those bills were so concerned about the business community's involvement that when they moved to push a bill in Arizona, that mm -hmm. ended up stripping uh, a number of citizens from what is known as the permanent absentee voter file. These are citizens who over the years had signed up to receive absentee ballots in Arizona, um, and the bill stripped them from having being able to do that. The people behind that bill were so concerned about the business community's ability in Arizona to influence the legislature that they advised the Arizona Senate to not put the bill's vote on a, cal a public calendar, to bring it up spontaneously, and to have the governor sign it within an hour so that the Phoenix and Maricopa business community could not raise public objections to it. And that's exactly what happened. And they caught the business community flat-footed there. And I think that was because they did recognize that in both Georgia and in Texas, those major corporations speaking out did make a difference in getting the legislatures there to strip some of the most um, troubling provisions out of those bills. Now, you note that at a national level, that has not yet moved 
Congress to, for example, move the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement mm -hmm. Act on a bipartisan basis. I think that is largely because the size of the audience and the size of the political playing field nationally is different than it was in Georgia and Texas, right? In Georgia and Texas, you could actually have, as you guys were involved with, a couple of very forceful statements from the business community that because of the media ecosystem, the political landscape in a single state really did make a difference. But to make a difference at a national level, obviously you need a much more uh, loud uh, voice, you need a much more organized effort, you need a much broader group of companies speaking out. And so I think what that suggests is two things. One, the state efforts work, and we are now going to see efforts in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania to try to follow in the footsteps mm -hmm. of Georgia and Texas. And if we can learn the lessons of Arizona, the business community cannot be reactive. They cannot wait until those bills begin moving. They need to get out there in front of them and make it clear that they don't want those states to become laboratories for undemocracy. And then at a national level, it is simply going to take a greater groundswell of support from the business community, because that is something, of course, that <clears throat> both parties are dependent on making sure that they stay relatively in the good graces of. And so I think the answer is not that it doesn't work, but that we need more of it and we need it earlier. Okay, let, let, let me ask you about another strategy, which is the cultural piece, maybe or the moral piece of companies weighing in <clears throat> based on a set of you know, broader societal principles <clears throat> that democracy is consistent with their values, consistent with maybe diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and that those values are important to their employees and more important to their stakeholders. So as you said, there's a legislative strategy, which is essential, but there also seems to be a need for greater cultural engagement, civic engagement, sort of challenging the erosion of the norms, challenging the language that certain politicians are using, not enabling certain rhetoric uh, to spread. So. What advice do you have about how business can play in that area? Well, you all saw the slides that I showed that pointed to an erosion in American support for the idea of democracy, right? And that that is, large, that is a larger percentage of the, of the population among younger Americans. And that's for understandable reasons. And just to sort of say a word about that. So I'm Generation X, born in 1976. I, I'm probably the last American generation that had confidence that I was going to do better than my parents. And to whatever extent I thought that American de government and democracy was failing, the counter example I grew up with were the breadlines of the Soviet Union. And so the Churchill quote that Bonk alluded to earlier was evident on its face that whatever whatever weaknesses American democracy had, it was certainly better than the alternatives. But if you're growing up, you're younger than me, you're millennial, Gen Z, Gen Y, well, first off, you're not likely to do better than your parents, at least according to current trends. And second off, those who are, are your peers and counterparts in China, uh, an authoritarian state, or frankly, your peers and counterparts in Turkey, which had obviously double digit GDP growth over the last two decades. Um, and so that, mo that Churchillian model is not as visible. So it's, it's under, and, and you're another generation or two removed from World War II. Right. And so for me, growing up with a grandfather who fought in World War II, understanding the stakes was something I was raised in. It's not something people are raised in today. And so it's understandable that they might be what we call autocratic curious. Are there other forms of government that might work better? Business has a role to play in helping make the case for why democracy is a preferable form of government, because not all of this can be solved through legal, legislative, rule of law based means. Fundamentally, this is a social cultural challenge for us to re-embrace the values of democracy as a society. And obviously our businesses are some of the most important pillars of our communities. And to the extent that they are doing public education and supporting the idea of active citizenship and supporting the idea of embracing our representative democratic form of government, those are really important roles that business can play as one of the most trusted and respected institutions in our communities. Right. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, um, Ian, <clears throat> and essentially asks the, um, you know, how do you deal with the implicit fear of fomented by racism and a loss of power uh, and control uh, by, you know, by, by the incumbents in politics? And so I'm thinking that, you know, in most autocratic societies, be it China, Hungary, Turkey, there's uh, the minority is demonized. Um, is uh, challenged in its legitimacy to maybe participate in the political system. Uh, 
So we seem to be seeing some of that in the United States as a political tool by some on the far right. And do you have any thoughts about, again, how the, the issue of racism can be addressed and maybe what businesses role is in, in factoring that into their support for democracy? I mean, look, the idea of divide and conquer has been the tyrant's playbook since antiquity, um, going back to the days of, you know, sort of Greece and Rome, that was the strategy that tyrants used was to turn people on each other in order to be able to protect uh, the leadership from accountability. And so, of course, you're seeing that around the world today, whether it is Eastern Europe demonization of immigrants or whether it is unfortunately the tragic United States history of demonization of communities of color. Um, I think there's a couple of things that are important here. One um, is to deny the idea that we can be divided in that way. We need to be one United States. We need to recognize uh, the history of racism and exclusion we've had and go to remediate that, but we cannot fall into different uh, tribal groups in this country that has never worked as a way of sustaining a democracy. The great challenge of the United States is the promise that we could create a truly multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy that the world has never actually had one of those. And that is gonna be the challenge we have uh, over, over sort of the coming decades. And I think supporting the vision that we can be a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy in which everybody has a stake and an equal perch from which to participate is a value that is gonna be important for businesses to support so that our country can actually achieve that aspiration going forward. Um, and so that, that is another way in which in businesses as community institutions can reinforce an important pillar of what it means to be a 21st century democracy and achieve what we've never been able to achieve before. Great, good. Ian, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we need to leave it there, but uh, I do encourage folks to check out the Protect Democracy website, many useful resources. So Ian, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your involvement and support. Thank you. Thank you. Good, so let's, um, let's build on Ian's assessment of the trend for authoritarianism and uh, its greater, greater acceptability in many places across the world. And look now at the relationship between a democratic political system and a capitalist or free market economic system. And we're really happy to have with us Didi Kuo from Stanford University. Um, to walk us through uh, an assessment of the relationship between these two um, factors. And Didi is, is a, re a research scholar, senior research scholar, and associate director for research at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. And her research in interests include democracy, dem democracy, political parties, and political reform. She is in the process of writing a book um, that will be published next year on political parties and the crisis of democratic capitalism. And uh, Didi is also a, an advisor to Business for America. And Didi, thanks for joining us this morning, this afternoon. Thank you so much, Business for America and all of the co-sponsors. Um, thank you, Ian, for that great presentation. So I'm here to have a sort of back out and have a high level discussion about the relationship between democracy and capitalism, which of course have defined the modern era, but historically evolved together in ways that were mutually beneficial and I think are worth remembering, particularly on a historic day like today. So 30 years ago on December 8th, uh, the Belovetsa Accords were signed, which officially dissolved the Soviet Union. And if you go all the way back to December 8th, 1949, that was the day that Chiang Kai-shek took the Nationalist Party from China over to Taiwan, sort of said we'd, we're going to hole up here for a while um, while the Maoists officially took China. So historically, we know that uh, in the 20th century, there were big ideological battles between democracy and authoritarianism on the one hand and the economic systems of capitalism and communism on the other. Once the Cold War ended 30 years ago, my colleague Frank Fukuyama, who we're sharing a wall right now, he's right over there, declared the end of history, meaning most nations would likely choose a path towards democracy since people want political rights, they wanna choose their own form of government, and also towards 
global capitalism. Um, and as a result, many nations liberalized their economies. Um, they embraced some more trade than they had pot potentially participated in in the past. We saw a new era of globalization and economic growth after that. But in 2021, we are at, as Ian described, a sort of standstill. We have a rise in democracy with adjectives, hybrid regimes, illiberal regimes, um, and a lot of discontent, a sort of legitimacy crisis among states that are both democratic and capitalist. And that's true both in what we would call the advanced liberal democracies, those that have been democratic for a long time, and also in emerging de democratic um, countries. So, why do we need democracy? Why have all these nations chosen democracy and yet democracy has gotten stuck? Well, going all the way back to Aristotle, we know that democracy has intrinsic value. People have rights. They want to determine how they are governed. And in a lot of writings since then, particularly by people who we'd think of as classical liberals, we have protected those individual rights through a system of government that allows people to choose their leaders in free and fair elections. Now, the difficult thing is that we can all agree in principle on the um, benefits of democracy and on the need for them. And yet, when you're actually implementing these, these principles in practice, it can get very messy. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in the United States today, not to mention the broader sort of illiberal autocratizing countries. For example, we can debate about what free and fair elections actually mean, how people should access the ballot, what rules should constrain them, and who should decide how ballots are counted. These are really old debates that we've had in the United States since the 18th century and that we continue to have today. And the reason that they are important, just like we have debates over which rights are actually protected in the Constitution, is because they determine the distribution of political power. So it's not simply our intentions that matter or whether or not we agree in principle on the rules of the game, but rather what what exact rules are implemented by the people in charge that shape things like how we aggregate votes or how we distribute seats in Congress, for example. But there are other reasons to support democracy besides just individual rights, which is that democracy has instrumental value. If you believe in outcomes and empirics, we know that democracy delivers more than authoritarianism. There are at least three reasons that scholars have identified. The first is just information. Democracy allows freer flows of information, greater transparency. That's why the Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen wrote that democracies don't have famines because there are better information flows that allow leaders to respond to crises. We also know that dem democratic countries make more investments in their economy. They support public education, for example. They have greater social development, i.e. healthier populations, less infant mortality, and they inv make investments in capital, both human capital and hard capital, like the infrastructure that allows an economy to flourish. And finally, one of the reasons that democracy has instrumental value is competition alone. Robert Dahl, a famous democratic theorist, wrote that you cannot have democracy without competition. You need competition in party systems over ideas, and you also need competition within markets. Um, we have competition in, therefore, economic, social, and political dimensions of our lives that allow the best ideas to come forward. And in fact, if you read Supreme Court jurisprudence now about the First Amendment, this is often the principle that it comes down to, that we protect all kinds of speech, even speech that we hate, because when we allow open speech, that allows the best ideas to come to the top. Now, when we dig down into why democracy and capitalism are particularly mutually beneficial, it's because democracy has historically generated economic growth. So back in the mid uh, 1700s or so with the rise of the first industrial revolution, we know that economic development at that point helped to propel more um, sort of claims for democracy. And in the 19th century, we know that workers' rights uh, coalesced into movements for broader democratic rights. So people who thought that they were sort of losers in an economic system or deserved greater protections also wanted a say in how they were governed and, want, and extensions of the suffrage were often made as a result of really active workers' um, uh, movements. So the reason that capitalism and democracy have historically gone together is because a democracy can actually do a lot to help capitalism be productive. Democracy reduces arbitrary interference in the economy by, say, autocratic leaders and is associated with much less corruption because publics don't like corruption. So when you have voting publics, they typically vote out corrupt leaders over time. We also know that democracy is much better at enshrining principles of rule of law, for example, neutrality in judicial decision making. They have more robust court systems that are appointing that appoint you know, neutral arbiters of the law. They have greater protections of property rights and also contract enforcement. And without these things, you cannot really have a functioning market economy. 
And finally, capitalism produces tensions. Capitalism is a system of economic production, not a system of governance. Therefore, it can create things like market externalities, um, or it can create tensions with principles such as equality and fairness that democracy enshrines. And as a result, democracy allows there to be compromises, big compromises between, for example, capital and labor, um, and between different kinds of groups who benefit in different ways from capitalism. So when there are market externalities, you need governments, democratic governments, to come and resolve them. For example, problems of pollution and climate change, of sustainability. Um, you also have consumer protections and worker protections that are typically created by bargains with democratic governments. And finally, perhaps most importantly, democracies have a strong social contract that allows protections and allows for the flourishing of human life, even when there are things like economic crises or protracted uh, you know, structural changes to the economy that might create some imbalances and who's winning and who's losing at any given time. Within the United States itself, so these a lot of what I'm citing about the relationship between democracy and economic growth is from studies of countries over time or countries compared with one another. Um, but if you just look inside the United States, there's a very recent paper showing that from a 150 year time period, about the 1870s all the way to the 2010s, democratic competition at the state level is also associated with better capitalist outcomes. For example, there is greater spending in states with competition between two parties. There's greater spending on health, education, and infrastructure. There's longer life expectancy and lower infant mortality. And finally, higher rates of education and higher incomes. So in the, in the United States, you know, there have been very regional patterns of development over time. I'm from Georgia, so we know that after the Civil War, uh, well, we know that prior to the Civil War, the southern states were agrarian, non-industrialized economies that didn't really change after the Civil War either, and there were single party regimes in a lot of those states in what my uh, colleague Rob Mickey at the University of Michigan has called subnational authoritarianism, and we have empirical evidence that this has inhibited economic development over time in those regions. We also have ample evidence that autocracy is bad for not just capitalists, but for growth overall. So there are many different modes of you know, economic productivity in autocratic states. Some of them are, in, some are agrarian, some are not yet industrial, but among those places that do have some kind of capitalism or market economy, there tends to be much more kleptocracy and rent seeking in authoritarian governments, meaning when there is economic productivity, a lot of it is expropriated by the government. We also know that there is more political corruption, less neutral bureaucracy, and as a result, there are many things like bribes or networking that you have to do to the grease the wheels of business deals. And finally, we know that government engages in co-optation and predation strategies. So business is always on edge. There's not really some free market in which you can compete. There are no, you know, there's no solid understanding of the rules of the game or adequate contract enforcement that allows businesses any kind of stability or certainty in the, oper the sort of environment in which they're operating. And we've seen this lately in the news with the way the Chinese government is cracking down on different kinds of businesses, trying to prevent them from you know, being publicly listed on foreign stock markets, for example. Um, you sort of never know when they're coming for you, as Ian mentioned. So to shift gears a little bit, what do capitalists do when they are you know, operating under a democratic regime? Do they help democracy? Do they inhibit it? We know that capitalism benefits from democracy, but we also know that capitalism creates tensions. Capitalists tend to want things like higher profits, or they might benefit from lower wages or flexible labor markets. And this is something that has contributed to a crisis of democratic legitimacy across the world. People feel both as workers, consumers, um, that they are getting sort of a less good deal, as Ian mentioned, than previous generations. We know that economic mobility has declined, and we know that wealth and income inequality have increased dramatically. So as a result, a problem of you know, equality or the economy tends to be blamed on democratic governments, but also tends to decrease um, support for the capitalist system overall. And this has really helped populists and liberal leaders who decry the system as being rigged. So we know that capitalists must actively support democracy, lest they themselves also fall victim to some of these populist insurgencies. And historically, the way capitalists have done this 
is by making compromises over things like social policy or regulation. Mark Misrucki, a sociologist at the University of Michigan, has written extensively about how the Committee on Econo Economic Development after World War II was a group of business leaders who came together, developed enlightened self-interest, as Bonk mentioned at the top. Um, they were behind the Marshall Plan, the Employment Act of 1946, Medicare, and an expansion of public education and housing. Um, and this was because of a recognition that you need some kind of stability and growth and prosperity at a fundamental social level in order to have a thriving capitalist sector. Also in the 1960s, this was a period that Ian just discussed, but in support, um, in laying support for voting rights and civil rights, businesses often had to take a stand in, in Southern states, for example, on whether they supported segregation or not. I'm from Atlanta, which if you look at Atlanta and Birmingham compared in the 1960s, they were very similar, but the Atlanta mayor decided on a strategy of being the city too busy to hate, welcomed desegregation, many businesses moved their operations to Atlanta, and as a result, Atlanta became a thriving sort of node in the economy of the South and in the, the, all the nation, whereas Birmingham really continues to this day to struggle. Um, so we know that there are benefits to businesses of embracing social change. And finally, we know that capitalism relies on democratic stability. It is not good for the economy when there is not agreement on the rules of the game, when there is disagreement on the legitimacy of election outcomes. A business are often making decisions based on what they think will happen in the political environment, how a change in leadership might affect a change in policy. And that becomes much harder to do when there's not even agreement on how we select our leaders uh, or if there are is widespread civil discontent, protest, and political violence, which is not to say that I am opposed to protest, for example. It's mass mobilization is often the only strategy available to people who are discontented, but it is certainly not the kind of thing that creates market stability in the long run run and is usually in response to democratic legitimacy issues. And finally, the point that I want to make is that it is bad for capitalists when democratic governments are not doing their jobs, because when democracy is not working effectively, business is called to solve public problems that are not really their business to solve. So we know that pr the private sector and philanthropic organizations had to spend a lot of money on election administration in 2020, sometimes to fill a void left by state governments in their sort of willingness to um, have adequate you know, administrative protections around the vote during COVID. We also know that a lot of the pandemic response was funded, for example, PPE or protecting workers or developing even just the rules of how your business could work was left to businesses during, during COVID-19 for many different reasons. Um, these are not really, you know, when you have a functioning democracy, you would hope that the government is better able to provide guidance and support um, in, in sort of their lane. We also know that there have been greater calls for social, environmental, and governance goals in the corporate sector that really high profile people, Warren Buffett, um, Larry Fink, have decried shareholder capitalism and said, said we have to open up our ideas of who the stakeholders are, including our workers and our consumers. But the pressure on businesses to solve a host of social problems like climate change or Gun, gun rights in the United States, gun regulation, um, healthcare and ongoing issues around that are all much more difficult and it become, the pressure becomes much greater when Congress itself cannot really get its act together. And finally, we know that the policy process in a democracy, as Bonk mentioned, is messy. Public policy requires representation of different interests, requires a process of open deliberation, and ultimately requires legislation that is not going to please all people. There's no such thing as a perfect piece of legislation that satisfied, satisfies all different constituencies. And yet, that is what democracy is. I do think that a lot of the idea that parties need to be unified or that everybody needs, you know, Congress is about, um, can never show some kind of disagreement on the aspects of a policy is a little bit silly because that's exactly what we should expect from the legislative process. So I think that if businesses are more involved in helping to support political organization, both at the grassroots and state and national levels, that that can help aggregate interests in the political realm and ensure that we have um, adequate representation there rather than business having to be the arbiter of these things or the, the financer of, of these really important social issues. Um, so I'm happy to turn it over to Bonk or, or Richard for questions and thank you again for this important discussion. Beauty, thank you so much. That was a great 
um, great summary of the challenges we face. And, um, you know, that, that was a short graduate course. So th th thank you for presenting that to us. Um, you know, for the sake of time, I just want to ask really one, one question, which is sort of how companies can make the case you're making. And I'll give you a quick example to think about. In Pennsylvania, Business for America has launched a project called Getting Back to Business. And our contention mm -hmm. is that while the legislature, some in the legislature, relitigates the 2020 election, pursues a fraud it, um, seeks to change the rules around election access and voting, they're ignoring the economic challenges that the COVID pandemic presented. Mm -hmm. And it seems there's a, a degree of di political dysfunction in the legislature, and it's become a very partisan issue. Uh, so the economic, the economy, the capitalist system within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is suffering because of a lack of adherence to democratic norms. So how does a business who cares about these issues, who's coming to see their self-interest and society's self-interest challenged uh, by political dysfunction, how do they participate in supporting a more you know, stable economy? Uh, you know, what, what advice do you have? That's really tough. I think that um, one of the, during the initial, you know, 2020 wave of state action, so Georgia, Texas, all those voting rights bills, when the CEOs first became really vocal about their opposition to that legislation, they, there were some, you know, I would say center left publications that often uh, wrote up exposés of different lobbying organizations in corporations that were still working with the state Republican parties, for example, to pass favorable legislation when it came to, you know, regulation or economic redistribution or taxation policy, that kind of thing. And I, I think that even though the public may not be super aware of these kind of minute different ways that businesses interact with politics, sometimes it might require a more blatant um, sort of disconnection with people who are bad actors in democracy. So people who potentially, you know, on January 6th, who were more involved in supporting some of the people who rioted at the Capitol uh, or people who refused to certify the election results, those kinds of representatives really present a challenge for businesses. And it might be worth asking whether or not there are some uh, individuals or state level parties that are just not worth working with, even if they're going to get you low taxes. Right. But I think that also this points to the need to support structural political reform of the kind in the For the People Act, which then got watered down um, uh, by Joe Manchin. But I, I doubt that will pass in this Congress. But I think that for businesses, it would be helpful to actually have more regulation and a clear federal floor for things like voting rights or campaign finance, um, how the redistricting process works. These are things that uh, historically have invited some business interaction that the public doesn't really like. And if there are clearer rules around some of the, some of the political process, particularly campaign financing, or at least greater disclosures, then I think corporations would both feel more comfortable undertaking their sort of regular lobbying efforts. And also the public would feel a little bit better about the relationships between our political and economic elites. Great, good. Didi, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. You. And uh, I think we, we will look to do a entire webinar uh, program on this theme of the capitalism and democracy at some point. So thank you. Great, thanks. Good, so let's turn to, the, uh, to our panel and of, of business leaders who can amplify a number of the points that both Didi and Ian have made. So we're really happy to have with us uh, Joel Elliott from Salesforce. Uh, Joel is the Senior Federal Affairs Director at Salesforce. He spent, uh, prior to that uh, position, he spent 17 years on Capitol Hill, most of the time working with Senator Joe Donnelly from Indiana. Um, and Joel served as the Chief of Staff for Senator Donnelly and also when the Senator was a Congressman. We're also really happy to have Dave Leichman, who's a Senior Strategist with Microsoft within Microsoft's Democracy Forward initiative. <clears throat> and um, Dave is also part of the company's social responsibility initiatives and works domestically and internationally on election security issues. 
Um, so welcome both Joel and Dave, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> so gentlemen, um, <clears throat> you've heard a lot about the responsibility of business in supporting democratic norms, uh, the value of business for its own economic interest in supporting a healthy democracy. But let me ask each of you, and Joel, let me uh, start with you. <clears throat> you know, what are some of the moral and economic reasons why Salesforce um, is getting involved in supporting a healthy democracy? Well, thank you, Richard, and thanks to Business for America for, for having this uh, webinar. I think from a moral point of view, uh, it's most important just for us all to remember our basic civics, which is that, you know, it's the people who should determine who governs them. Uh, I think that's central to the American character, and it's a big part of what makes us exceptional uh, as a nation. And, and when we're talking about the people, I think, I think we're talking about all of the people who are eligible to vote. And, and by voting, we mean, you know, people should have equal access to the ballot. Um, and, and to state the obvious here, companies like Salesforce are made up of people, you know? So in our case, that's tens of thousands of people here in the United States. That's people of all races, ages, ethnicities, and geographies. Um, our, our CEO and founder has said that one of his, Mark Benioff has said that one of his most important jobs as a leader of our company is to have his employees' backs. And so practically, I think that that means when it comes to our elections, that all of those employees, wherever they are in the United States or whatever they look like or whatever their age, that they're able to participate in their democracy. And I think that it also means that we, they, all of us are able to live in a stable democracy where our safety and well being is never threatened by tumult uh, caused by a weaponized and warped politics. So, th so for me, that's sort of the, mm -hmm. the big picture kind of moral aspect. I think the, the practical aspect is a little more straightforward. And Dee Dee uh, did a wonderful job of laying out all of these pieces. Um, but we have the largest and most highly developed uh, democracy, excuse me, economy in the world. And there are many reasons for that. But I think one important reason is that we have had for decades upon decades, a stable form of government uh, that relies on the consent of the people. And if we move away from that tried and true construct, I think the less solid our economic foundation will be. And my proof point for this has been over the last several months, I keep going back to it, but in July, uh, Fitch Ratings highlighted uh, this threat in explaining what risks it sees to our nation's credit rating. Mm -hmm. And I'll just read very briefly from their report that, it, that accompanied this press release. Uh, and under the section of factors that could individually or collectively lead to negative rating action downgrade, structural, a deterioration in governance quality that undermines the integrity of the US political system with potential negative implications for the effectiveness of the government and institutions in managing the economy and absorbing adverse shocks. So those are the, mm -hmm. the main moral and political aspects of this that I see, Richard. Okay, Joel, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Dave, let me ask you the same question. And, you know, Microsoft, um, as I noted, is working domestically on election security, um, combating mis and disinformation, but you're also doing that internationally, you know, across the globe. So from Microsoft's perspective, what are the moral and economic reasons why, you know, you and the company are supportive of a healthy democracy? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Richard Bonk and BFA for allowing us to participate in this. Uh, really excited for this. Excited also for this week's uh, Summit for Democracy. Um, I, look, from a moral perspective, I think um, I, can, I can draw a straight line right back to the mission, the core mission of Microsoft, right? Which is to empower everyone on the planet to do more. We can't empower everyone on the planet to do more if they don't have basic fundamental human rights, the right of self-determination, all the things that democracy supports, right? Um, so it's actually a pretty, a pretty easy, easy sell, right? That, that we should um, take on the moral burden of uh, 
promoting democracy and fighting authoritarianism. Um, but to to get to the practical aspects of things, the economic um, aspects, you know, what what Dr. Kuhoff said was was phenomenal. First of all, it was great, like <laughs> a lot packed into uh, 15 minutes there. But um, a few of the key points to to draw a line here are, um, you know, first of all, look, businesses like predictability. Um, predictability is the friend of share price, is the friend of budget planning. Um, authoritarian regimes are notoriously unpredictable. Um, you look at uh, what Russia did um, just a few weeks ago in demanding that many of the large social media companies um, open headquarters in Moscow. Lord knows what that even means. Um, they weren't clear on it, and those companies still are trying to figure out what uh, what the directive actually meant. That's exactly the kind of thing that um, you know, in a democratic society, we don't have arbitrary um, demands placed on us by an authoritarian regime. Um, the the other thing is, uh, you know, um, like this is to look at like uh, as an example the the Cloud Act that was passed a few years ago. We like predictability in legislation as well, right? And a lot of times the, the ethos of the company is, look, we don't care. I mean, we, we do care. We, we have lobbyists. We try and influence the way things move so that they are positive to us and to our bottom line. But in the end, having rules is better than not having rules, right? And, and even if they aren't as beneficial to us as we'd like them, predictability is a benefit to a company overall and democracy and the rule of law are the ultimate in predictability. Good, <clears throat> Dave, thanks. Let, let me ask you both to um, reflect a little bit <clears throat> on the actions that the company, your company has been able and willing to take over the past several years. You know, clearly we have seen uh, some blowback against companies that have stood up, you know, whether it was Coca-Cola or Dell, um, others, you know, as, as well have been targeted as, as we have heard as woke capitalists, there's a risk associated with defending democracy. Um, it does not comport well with an autocrat's view of what the private sector should do. You know, I, I think at one point, you know, the minority leader of the house, or maybe it was actually major, uh, minority leader, uh, Mitch McConnell said, you know, business should essentially shut up make widgets, employ people, pay your taxes, but don't get involved in political issues. So Joel, from, you know, from Salesforce perspective, um, you have a lot of tools available. Um, what have you found is most impactful, particularly over the past few years, and what do you anticipate doing to address these threats that you're increasingly concerned about? The company really started kind of investing in civic engagement work several cycles back. And, uh, and prior to the 2020 cycle, I would say kind of shifted into hyperdrive. And that included everything from, you know, giving employees election day off to granting volunteer time off for people to do nonpartisan poll work, facilitating the uh, registration of voters and, and bringing in elected officials and candidates uh, to speak to our employees. And um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's the very practical nature of that, which is someone can vote once you've registered them, but there's also this um, maybe less obvious way where you're reminding people that they are, they are personally part of the political process. Uh, sometimes we lose sight of that as just one individual that we have a role to play. And you hear people say, well, your vote counts, but sometimes it's very easy to dismiss this. And so I think that by weaving these things into the work that we do, um, it is hopefully reminding folks that, you know, they are the body politic. They and their neighbors and their friends at church or wherever, they're the ones who are consenting to be governed by the people that we have elected. I think in the bigger picture, though, and um, in the run-up to the 2020 election, um, Salesforce, and, and Dave may want to speak to this, but Microsoft was too, was one of, both were more than one of about 700 companies that joined a, uh, 
civic alliance led effort entitled 100% in for democracy which was which, which was a bit more specific in what uh, uh, we, we were committed to and that was calling for safe access to the polls for all voters uh, recognizing that state and local election officials are the trusted source for certified election results and then encouraging patients as the votes were being counted um, and then subsequent to that, after January 6th, there were another 400 companies that put out a statement um, calling for a peaceful transition of power. I mean, I think, I think those conversations that we've been having now for several years will continue. Um, and I think we'll be asking ourselves some questions that we've not asked ourselves before because things are changing on the ground so rapidly. But I think it's encouraging that we're having the conversation to begin with. Uh, Joel, thank you. Dave, let me ask you to answer the question maybe with a lens of how the company is combating mis and disinformation, why that's so important, and how that affects what Joel just said about confidence in elections and the trust people have in institutions. And also, you know, Microsoft has a democracy forward initiative. So you're putting it right out there, right? So um, you are a target and um, hopefully a, uh, a, a part of the solution as well. So what, what is Microsoft doing um, to support a, hel a healthy democracy on a you know, more tactical basis, if you would? Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, first, I just wanna say like, thank you to Joel for all of his and Salesforce efforts in the past. I mean, uh, Civic Alliance, which, which we were both um, founders of, um, has been an incredible boon. It went from something like 10 companies as the turbo vote challenge back in uh, 2017 to almost, a th I think it's over a thousand now. Um, it's pretty incredible um, as, a, as an entity to resource um, companies that want to do civic outreach, civic education, and, and put, put uh, civic engagement out, out front. Um, so you, you said, you know, why we, we have democracy forward initiative and we're out there, right? Um, I think it's fascinating you, what you did to intro the question to Joel. Um, I think it's fascinating to look at, you know, the criticisms of programs like this as being woke or, you know, uh, we should keep our nose out of politics. Um, that's counterfactual. That goes against the actual um, surveys and evidence that's out there that says that the vast majority, and I'm not trying to quote numbers right now, you, they're, they're available on uh, Democracy is Good for Business, I think their website, but uh, you can look at the numbers, something like 80% of consumers expect large brands to be working to secure democracy at this point. I mean, it's, how could I ignore something like that? How could we as a company ignore something like that? Um, it's contrary to good business to, to not be um, working to protect democracy. All that aside. Uh, we have a, a pretty robust program at Microsoft. The Democracy Forward Initiative concentrates on advocating for open and secure elections, uh, information integrity, which to your point, fighting disinformation, but also uh, protecting journalism, which I think is another critical part of that. Um, so not just fighting disinformation, but making sure that uh, there are robust um, systems in place for getting information to citizens. Uh, and then civic engagement, which uh, we call corporate civic responsibility. And that's utilizing our properties, much the same as all the other civic alliance companies um, to encourage voter registration um, and also working with our own employees on things like time off to vote, on things like making sure they're all registered to vote and, and have, uh, have their voices heard internally too. Um, fighting misinformation is so critical now. I, I think, uh, you know, we, we talked about this uh, when we were prepping for, for this panel, but I think that's the whole ball game now. Um, we've got to figure out as a society what we're doing. I mean, we can, we can work on resilient journalism. We can work on putting out fires when it comes to, uh, to fighting disinformation, but there is something fundamental going on in, in the US and the world um, that is a, a fight for the soul of democracy um, and a fight for the soul of what it means to have an information economy um, and I think that, you know, some of the businesses that operate in the information economy are going to have to have um, come to Jesus moments on, on how, how they, they are, I don't want to say responsible, but how they could 
fundamentally change business models to, to help the situation. Um, we do a lot of work through our own properties. You know, we're the distant second, but we are the second largest search engine. Um, and we do a lot of work around surfacing good trusted information, like Joel said, uh, around elections um, and fighting disinformation internally. Um, and I, like I said, I think moving forward, that's probably the whole ballgame when it comes to secure elections. Yeah. Okay. Good. I know there's a lot more we can talk about <clears throat> regarding mis and disinformation. Um, it's probably a whole panel itself. <laughs> it, it, it is. It is essential. Um, let, let me ask, um, and this probably has to be, well, maybe we have time for two short more questions, but let me um, ask. So Dave and Joel, you both have identified some strategies and types of initiatives, you know, be they legislative in the advocacy area, the civic engagement, the education about dis and misinformation. <clears throat> but let me ask about money in politics and the role of business in terms of using its clout through a PAC or a 527 to support or not support certain candidates and political leaders who might not be advocates of democracy. Um, we've had a few questions about that theme, you know, what is the role of business in um, supporting pro-democracy candidates or withdrawing financial support from those who, for instance, supported the um, decertification of the election? Um, Dave, would you like to go first? Sure, um, I can say that practically Microsoft did uh, cut off support for um, candidates who, or the, the elected officials who did not vote to certify the election on January 6th. Um, I think that was a great step and something that's really important. Um, yeah, I mean, Joel, I... Yeah. yeah, our political action committee has been frozen since January 6th. And uh, if and when uh, we get it back up and running, uh, I think that that will be uh, one of the component parts that we, that we weigh when we're making determinations as to uh, who should receive money from the PAC. I think aside from um, <clears throat> campaign donations specifically, I mean, this was occurring to me uh, earlier when either Ian, uh, Ian or Didi was speaking, but you know, whether it's companies or anyone else, one thing that we can all do is find ways to support people who are acting in ways that are very clearly pro-democracy right uh, and that's not just money and that may require some people to set aside even their their long-held partisan allegiances because if if somebody is really walking the walk on the other side of the aisle from where you sit uh, maybe it's time for us as americans to think about what we can do to help folks like that right okay Good. And let me ask a final question. And if you could condense your answer to a complicated question, but um, you know, given the role of the private sector vis-a-vis -vis the public sector and the legitimate role that a government has in organ, you know, helping to structure society and make decisions, how do we ensure that um, you know businesses are an advocate for democracy, but not the cop? Um, because you know we we don't want to slide into a corporatist state either, uh, as we do an authoritarian state. Um, Dave, would you like to answer that? Sure. I mean, I, I think it gets to public-private partnership, right? Like the, we we work to bolster uh, the resources of the public sector, and especially when it comes to uh, I think election security is a great example, um, and that's actually one of the things that I do at Microsoft mm -hmm. is we work with. Um, everyone down to the county level on uh, bolstering cybersecurity and trying to get you know free resources to uh, election management officials when we can that allow them to to do their job because look uh, you know we have a decentralized system of democracy in the US which is a feature not a bug um, but when it comes to you're a small county trying to run an election and you're trying to combat Russian disinformation or hacking attempts that's like asking a small town sheriff to repel a Russian invasion of tanks. Like you, they can't do it, right? They need help. And I think business has a unique role to play in bringing that help to bear, so. And, yeah, and I guess, yeah, I guess I would just say, I, I think a lot about how we pull apart this knot as a country 
And uh, I, I don't think that we can rely on Congress. Uh, and I spent over 17 years up there and I love the institution. There's a lot of very good people up there trying to do good things. I don't think we can rely on Congress. And so that means then it falls to us as uh, Americans and as citizens to try to figure this out. I think that business leaders are just one part of that, as well as community leaders, people like teachers and clergy and small business owners. I don't know exactly how we do it, but we have to figure out how to keep the train on the tracks. Um, and we need to be figuring that out soon. Good. Joel and Dave, thank you both so much. Um, really appreciate your involvement today. Thanks to Salesforce and Microsoft, both. And um, so we'll close up here just uh, with a few thoughts. Um, number one is Business for America is interested in talking with any of you who've participated in the webinar today. You can find us at, at uh, bfa.us on the web. Uh, we have a number of campaigns in 2022, including working on combating mis- and disinformation, working on election security, voting rights, and also an initiative on civic health where we'll engage companies um, and their employees in their communities. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention uh, thanks to our members. Business for America is a membership organization and those are our current members. We invite any companies listening today to consider joining. We're happy to chat with you all. And thanks so much for joining us today. And a reminder that the Summit for Democracy um, proceedings starting tomorrow and going through Friday are all online at the State Department website. And you can listen along and uh, we'd be happy to hear from all of you at any point. So thank you, Dee Dee, Joel, uh, Dave, and Ian. And uh, we hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.